I think the big shift that possibly can happen in startups is that far more companies are going to start like we started in 2004. And they're going to realize that all this is possible with AI, with the realization that remote is possible, with just being more effective and more capable as individual entrepreneurs, and also realizing, do you know what? The other option is just not available. I'm not going to go out and raise $5 million right now. I'm not going to go out and raise $10 million. Like the window has shut, so you have to. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Swiss listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. Embroker's startup insurance program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off of traditional insurance today at embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off using offer code twist. And the Equinix Startup Program provides hybrid infrastructure solutions for startups, including up to $100,000 in credits and personalized consultations and guidance from the Equinix team. Go to equinixstartups.com to apply today. All right, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. One of my favorite guests and one of yours, DHH on Twitter, on X, David Hanmeyer Hansen is with us again for his fifth official appearance on This Week in Startups. You get your jacket now, David. You get your fifth uh, appearance blazer. It's coming in the mail with a logo on Excellent. it that you've been on the show five times, December 2010, then 2013. Uh, and then 2020 before COVID, 2022. And uh, yeah, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm very good. It is a pleasure to be back. This is one of my favorite shows to do. Uh, and of course, if you don't know, uh, David is the uh, co-founder of Basecamp. Uh, and also, I guess you were the creator or co-creator of Ruby on Rails. Co-founder of 37 yeah, Sigma. Yeah, creator that was of just Ruby the, Rails, the yeah. one uh, the, at the start. But uh, now what, six and a half thousand people have code in Ruby on Rails and we're oh, going wow. on our 20th year. So Crazy. clearly not just mine anymore. And of course, uh, your co-founder is Jason Freed, uh, who's also been on the program many times. So, you know, the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, obviously you were one of the early pioneers in SaaS and cloud, um, got to profitability uh, and ran the company you know, uh, I think to be profitable, but I, I saw you had this once dot com where you, you have a new mission to for people to pay for software once explain, because you, you always come up with some ideas that sometimes are quixotic, sometimes they're brilliant, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't explain once.com. Sure. So the history is we were one of the earliest SaaS companies Basecamp was launched in 2004. We didn't even have the SaaS term back then. Yeah. And at that time, SaaS was just amazing. It was amazing because running your own software was a total pain in the ass. Um, it was licenses and it was installations and it was system requirements. It was all that stuff. So everyone was so excited when SaaS comes out. Oh, I just have to fill in a form and I can use a piece of software. Amazing. And we jumped on that and have been running Basecamp and a ton of other services. Hey.com, our new email service, SaaS businesses, 20 plus years. But... One of the things I love is this idea of the pendulum swinging, right? We go from client to serv uh, server, back to client, back to server. Many times over the uh, history of computing, we've gone from one extreme to the other. I think it's time for that pendulum to swing at least a little bit back mm. towards you being able to buy a software product mm. rather than buying a software service. Mm. And that's our thesis with once, that there is a category of software where it just does not make sense to pay on a monthly basis for it and to pay out the nose for something that is essentially a commodity. That's mm. sort of the two part play. One here being this is about price, this is about subscription fatigue. And then the second part of it is also about commoditization. We have a bunch of collaboration tools, for example, information systems that just the innovation is gone, like problems are solved. And when that happens in almost any other domain, someone pioneers a new product or mm. service. They get the market for themselves for a few years, and then at some point, competition moves in. And that's how capitalism is supposed to work. We're supposed to have competition. We're supposed to have alternatives, and we're supposed to have generics. Hmm. So that's the thesis with one. We're going to make a series of software products 
that mm. you can install, run on your own servers, but is essentially web apps. Um, mm. Think WordPress. That's one of the most successful software products out there. If you look at total yeah. websites running on the internet, I think it's like 40% of all in internet Crazy, websites. Yeah run WordPress, and it runs on that model. You download a piece of software, you set it up on your own little server. And what really connects me to that mission is this idea that this is what the internet was supposed to be. Mm. SaaS, unfortunately, to some extent, helped the centralization of the internet. Mm. First, it was just like, oh, everyone is going to run their version of Basecamp or Hey on our computers. It's just going to be one set of services. Even if we have hundreds of thousands of customers, they're all just running on our Computer. So if our computer goes down, Basecamp goes down for 100,000 customers. Now, mm. we have five nines of uptime, so it's not been a problem for us. But generally speaking, this idea that we have centralization, on top of that, now we have cloud centralization. So when AWS US East 1 goes down, about a third of the internet goes offline with it, right? That's not what DARPA designed. That's not mm. the internet that I fell in love with. The internet I fell in love with was we can all run our own stuff. I remember running websites back in the 90s. I would just run it on my own box. If my friend's web server went down, it had no impact on mine at all. So I think there's just a lot of these dynamics where we knew some truths when the mm. internet got started that we kind of sort of forgot or we gave them up for some conveniences that make sense at a time, but no longer do. Now, I'm not saying SaaS is like totally over. Every piece of SaaS software is going to be a product now. I am saying, though, I think there's a surprising amount of SaaS businesses that could be product businesses instead. Mm. And in that if you make that jump, the cost structure is completely different which means the pricing structure can be completely different, which means that you can now have competition in areas where you really couldn't before. Mm. One of the ones we like to call out is Slack, right? Um, I asked uh, uh, Toby, uh, my friend and CEO at Shopify, hey, uh, Toby, what are, you, what are you paying for uh, Slack? And he was mm. like, oh, dude, don't even, don't even get me started. It's, it's millions, yeah. millions, right? Millions a year on recurring revenue to use this SaaS service that's a commodity. I mean, Slack hasn't innovated in a long time, I think, since, uh, well, unless you call that redesign, they just did that yeah, everyone hated it innovation. Wasn't great, um, yeah. It's just, it got bought by Salesforce. This is the natural life cycle of startups. This is what happens. This is not necessarily good or bad or whatever. It's just that this is an example of a piece of software that should be commoditized, but it's difficult to do if you're going to go up against something like SaaS, right? Like what, are you going to price it like 20% cheaper? Are you going to add 5% more features? Mm. That's a tough competition to go up against when you have something entrenched. But imagine if I could go to Topi and say, hey, do you know what? That's Slack bill. Instead of you paying millions every year, what about you just pay me like $1,000 once? <laughs> All of a sudden- <laughs> Super disruptive, yeah. Exactly. You're dealing with orders of magnitude difference. And I think that's what's possible because like, I can't outcompete Slack on operations, for example. It mm. takes a lot of people to run SaaS software. It's actually yeah. still complicated to have millions of users. You need a lot of operations people. You need sophisticated setup, all this stuff. In the meantime, all these computers have gotten so much faster, so yep. much cheaper. You can now run so much more software on your own. But I think it hasn't clicked. And this is what often happens in, in technology. Same thing, like iPhone comes out and we go like, oh, a phone. I don't know what we're going to use this with. Five years later, everyone has figured out exactly what to use this with. We have yeah. all this innovation. And I think we're a little bit in that space right now with what's been happening with computers, how fast they've actually gotten just in mm. the last five, six, seven years, how yeah. much scale you can have on even the laptop I use for my development is it's faster bonkers. than all my cloud computing. Um, hey, you have an M3, yeah. I assume you got the M3, exactly. the new one, yes. it's just it was bonkers. That M3, it was like 16 cores, I'm running like my tests faster than what we're paying astronomical bills to run continuous integration in the cloud. There's just, there's something going on, there's something in the water, I think something is brewing and we're going we're gonna to give it a try. Now, ironically, Slack is an example of us being early. Like we had hmm. Slack in 2005, it was called Campfire. Yep, and we were just like a decade too early in two thousand five. Yeah. And there was just did chat, not see and there it. was uh, what was the one that um, uh, it wound up getting bought by Atlassian. Maybe that was HipChat. Hip chat, I think it was HipChat. Yeah, yes. yeah. There, I mean, there were competitors, and now yes. I guess Discord is the but only competitor. They were competitor, too but early. They were they too were early. early. There needs to be an open source, or you know, thousand dollars, and have as many people you want on the server because yes, 
what what they've done now is like I have a slack for my founders, so all the investments we've made, it's got 700 people in it. And they're like, we want $8 a person a month, $100 a person. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not paying you, right, whatever this is going to wind up being $70,000 a year. That's insane for just our founders to talk to each other. So if there was one for $700, or even $7,000, I would actually pay because I can't get the archives and then I would pop it yes. on a server and run it. Yes. Uh, and all these clouds are so cheap. I mean, I, it is amazing your point though about what's happened with Silicon. Like this, ma this I have the M2 MacBook Air with uh, mm -hmm. like a terabyte SSD and like 16 gigs of RAM. I cannot believe that for whatever it is, $1,500 or $1,800, this, their entry you level so computer much is power. absurd. <laughs> it yes. is absurd uh, how much power it is. So Listen, selling software is hard enough right now, man. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat out there in B2B land. The last thing you need to do is slow your sales team down because you don't have your SOC 2 dialed in. So if you're SaaS or a services company and you store consumer data in the cloud, you know what you need to do? You need to check out Vanta. They're going to get your SOC 2 compliant easier and faster. And Vanta makes it so easy to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. They're going to save you hundreds of hours of work and up to 85% on compliance costs. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on those major customers, the lighthouse customers, the big fish, the whales, because of silly stuff like lacking compliance. Just work with Vanta. I'm an investor in the company. It's a great company. Get your compliance automated. Get it tight. Tight is right. And close those big deals. Here's the best part. Vanta's going to give you a thousand off because they love this week in startups. They love startups. Vanta.com slash twist that's v-a-n-t-a dot com slash twist to get a thousand dollars off your stock too i want to ask you a question here about copywriting if you go to the once.com you're so good at branding you know I'm, I'm a sucker for a great domain name once.com that's a man i don't know how much once.com cost uh, but that's like a hundred thousand oh, or five hundred thousand dollar domain name. a little bit I, I have to sell quite a lot of software products to just recoup on on that one but uh that's that's, so good, i gotta though. give credit to jason here like jason really just beliefs in the power of branding. It was not sure. just once.com. Really, we bought Basecamp.com back in like 2012. We started on BasecampHQ.com because yeah. we're like, domain names don't matter and so on. And I still would advise that to most startups. Like, don't go sure, out and don't a million money, bucks yeah. in a fancy no. domain name. But at some point, it sort of sense a signal like we're serious and oh, yes. so we bought basecamp.com for what i thought at the time a lot of money in like 2010 12 or something and then we bought hey.com in yeah, like that's a million dollar domain yeah. that one was just like oh man brutal and then of course we were like all right we're launching a major new thing we really think that there could be a pivot in all of SaaS here we got to do it justice we got to do one stuff com even if it's gonna hurt and so this is going to oh so I, I say your copywriting is so good. Uh, you know, I'm a writer and I, I just I can game recognizes game here. Like when you write <laughs> stuff, you're Jason, I don't know if it's you or Jason or you guys work on it. But my God, if you just go to once.com and read it, like it's actually just so crystal clear. Something happened to business software, period. You used to pay for it once, install it and run it, whether on someone's computer or a server for everyone. It felt like you owned it and you did. I mean, it's just so well written. Um, what, you have a philosophy of copywriting at 37 Signals? Yes. How do you think and about it? I'm Tell glad me. you really yeah. recognize it because I think this is, of all the unique things about 37 Signals, I would call out writing as being mm. in that top three, that we take writing not just seriously, but incredibly seriously. Jason and I co-authored all the books that we wrote together ourselves. We didn't hand it off to a ghostwriter. Rework, which sold over half a million copies worldwide, we wrote it. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. We wrote it. All of this stuff resolve around writing. This is connected also to the fact that we're a remote company, have been for 20 years. This is the way we communicate everything. There's mm. just not this same oral tradition as you would have in a company with an office and a bunch of meetings and all that stuff. So we really hone it. And as Jason liked to say, copywriting is design. This is mm. traces it all the way back to 99. So 37 Signals gets founded in 1999. It's a design, a web design company at that time. And the homepage is just words. There mm. were not a graphic insight. In 1999, it was really weird to be a web design company and not have any graphics at all on your website. It was all just words. So 
this really originated with Jason. Uh, I'm passionate about writing as well. I write a tremendous amount on my Hey World blog and elsewhere. And we try to pour all of that into it when we do product design, and especially for something like once. Mm. Um, I always think back on that introduction of the iPhone that Steve Jobs spelled out here. Here are the three things. First, let me tell you your problem. You don't even know you have a problem yet. <laughs> First, yeah. I'm going to tell you you have a problem, right? This is what we're trying to do with once. Most people could go around thinking, oh, SaaS is a problem. They may go thinking, oh, this is too expensive, or I can't run my 700-person uh, uh, community on it because it just doesn't compute. But they don't know the problem is SaaS. That's mm. what we're trying to articulate. And you really got to do it so succinctly these days, even more so than ever. I mean, TikTok generation, everything just clip, clip, clip. Everyone's going to scan unless it actually speaks like a human whose intent on conveying something of importance to you. It can't read like marketing, garbly, googly, gong. No. And I think that, I mean, for us, it's just baked in. Before things were con called content marketing. That's basically what we built the entire business on. We built an entire audience and just sharing well what we've learned and what we've identified and our observations and so on. And it all flows into a crystallization like something like once.com. So once is going to have its first product at the end of this year, which is coming up. Uh, you got, I think you're down to like 30 days to get this product <laughs> out the door. You may need to update the web page <laughs> and put first quarter. Uh, but is the first one going to be a Slack competitor? Yeah. Um. You could put two and three together and yeah. uh, and see maybe cool. this is where we're going. Um, okay. Now, what's so funny, no of course, is... Now, but that would be a good one. I'll be the first customer. I'll tell you that. Actually, uh, let, let's just do it. Yes, it is. And, and okay. I would love to have you and the I, 700 uh, people on this as the beta tester. We'll get you set up. Well, Jason, the, and, uh, and the crazy thing is I started one for this week in startups as well, this very podcast, and I added all the people who had come to launch festival and all of our events. So yes. you know, there's like an import feature. So I just took all my emails for people who came to the event. And I said, Hey, we have a Slack instance. And all these people came. And so thousands of people start talking during COVID. And it was really right. inspiring until we realized they're talking so quickly that I'm hitting whatever the thousand or 10,000 messages. And then it yes. goes into frustration mode. And they're like, yes. can't see this conversation. And like, right. I'm in a thread where I can't see the start of the thread. And I'm yes. like, Oh, God. And then discord is like, chaos i don't know if you've ever used it, discord but i have yes it seems complete. like it, it came out of another problem it was trying to solve it's a um, video game like it literally is a video game for a video game yeah. community so when you try to use it like in a business context i'm like i don't need flair and things blowing yes, up yes and way and this was actually, way this was exactly part of the identification is part of generics to me is that you take the epicenter of an idea and you boil it down to basically just that Jason and I shine, uh, signed up recently for Slack. I don't know if you've done that recently, but it's a great product. And I don't want to Slack on. There's nothing more boring to hear in competitor go like, oh, the competition sucks. But yeah. just sign up for it. And just see, this happens to every product. I'm sure this happens to some extent to our own products. Something's been around for a while. It has been the recipient of hundreds of programmers, mm. thousands of salespeople who all promise the next yes. deal something. And it all shows up in checkboxes. If you go through and scroll through the same thing with Gmail, same thing with bottom so this is the natural entropy of software, right? This is what happens. But you sign up for Slack today and you go like, holy sh there's just so much like stuff. Frank all I want to do is chat. Yeah, I it's, mean, a fr it's I Frank and software. It's like yes. they bolted so many pieces yes. on, like you're saying, some corporate person's like, hey, you know, we can get Oracle to sign up for this for $8 million yes. if yes. we add these four Oracle specific features. And now it's like, okay, just ruin the experience for the other. 9,999 companies. Yeah, too and you complicated. you get killed by a thousand cuts, right? Like yeah. every single salesperson who's about to close that deal for, I don't know, 10,000 seats is going to go like, it's 10,000 seats. It could really move our next quarter. Of course, mm. can't you just add like one more checkbox? And before you know it, you run like that for five, six, seven years and you have a million checkboxes, right? I it's think it's going to be- the entropy of enterprise software. It's going to be so disruptive when you launch this because I think there's a lot of frustration out there uh, with that product specifically. Because of what you're saying, I think that there needs to be a fresh start. And it's yes. such a critical part of the infrastructure today of working uh, remote. And listen, there's no more charge conversation than working remote. But after post COVID, everybody got into it. And there's like, I just wrote a blog post today just about my thinking and how it's evolved on it a bit. One of the things I learned is once you've managed somebody uh, who is, you know, was in your office previously, you know them, you've got that social fabric, you've got the culture, 
And now they're working in Napa or Lake Tahoe, or they moved to Hawaii, wherever they are, living their best life. It's pretty easy to manage them. But then you start adding people. And okay, you got some people in Canada. Oh, and you got somebody in Uruguay. And then you got somebody in Manila. It becomes the same. But what's different is the salary structures and the cost structures are radically different. So the thing I'm seeing over and over again in our startups is they go on Fiverr, they go on Upwork, they find all these websites, and they hire people locally at local prices. And so this has just totally changed the cost structure. All right, listen, we work with startups, and they are all over the map. Most of them very early stage pre seed seed, you know, going on to their series A, but some of our investments have gone on to raise those late stage funding rounds, they've gotten acquired, hey, and a number of them have gone public. And there is one thing that unites them all, they need to have their business insurance tight if they want to succeed. This is obvious, a lot of founders ignore it, and they ignore it at their peril. If it's not tight, it's not right. And we need tight and right. And we send them to Embroker. Embroker is business insurance built specifically for startups. Their single application helps startups get four quotes for four lines of coverage in just 15 minutes. Uh, Embroker, they'll connect you with one of their expert brokers for unmatched service. And it goes beyond your policy. They'll make the process painless and transparent, especially when you compare them to the incumbents, which are slow. So try Embroker today with the code twist and get 10% off. They're already amazing prices. Their startup package in broker.com slash twist, E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R.com slash twist and use the code twist for 10% off. We love Embroker. Thank you for all the amazing support over the years, both on this program and the love and care you give to our startups. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, you guys were so early on the, uh, the work from home thing. W what's your latest thinking on it? and then how it's impacting startup culture. I think it's really interesting. Um, yeah. For us, we've run a profitable software company for 20 years. So we can afford sort of the luxury setup. The luxury setup we have is that more than half of 37 Signals employees are outside of the US, but we pay um, top 10% of San Francisco rates. Even though we wow. don't have anyone in San Francisco, this is base salary comparison. It's not RSU comparison. So it's not like everyone is getting like Netflix a million bucks with the all in. But still, mm. top 10% of base San Francisco salaries are pretty damn high, especially yeah. if you are in Spain or in Scotland yeah. or in any of these other Portugal, places where we yeah. have uh, Puerto uh, Rico. folks, right? But that is a very luxury setup because we, I don't know, through luck or skill, whatever suits you, uh, got into this thing with Basecamp and was just phenomenally profitable and has been so for a long time. I don't think that is true going forward for startups. I actually think there is a absolutely an opportunity here on the cost basis that whatever the, the average uh, median salary in San Francisco is what two and a half uh, or a quarter of a million for a software engineer or something just on base mm. pay plus a few other things right that'll get you five programmers or 10 programmers in different locales right yep. and because of all this technology now getting so good and everyone realizing that it's so good that remote is no longer this exotic thing that we can poo poo and say oh I mean, the magic of whatever we're creating can not happen if we don't have a water cooler, if we don't have a whiteboard and we're in the same room together. I think it's going to change things. But I think it's also one of those lagging things where we haven't seen the full effect of it. Kind of like as we talked about with ones, computers have gotten so much faster. We haven't really realized what does that do to business models? There's often a huge lag in terms of culture and mm. business models when new technologies and new paradigms come in where we don't realize like we had the tools five years ago. This is the reason with remote, for example, we wrote this book, Remote Office Not Required, in 2013. At yeah. that point, we'd been working remotely, Jason and I, for 12 years, 13 years. And we thought like, hey, we're just stating the obvious. And it was totally exotic at the time. Most startups were absolutely not working remotely. It wasn't until COVID that everyone really just switched over, right? All the technology was there like seven years ago. Yeah. What changed was the COVID culture shock. We yeah. have to, right? So now we realize we can and so on and so forth. So I do think that this cost pressure is going to come. I mm. think AI is going to be part of it. I think this idea that SaaS and the lavish profits or at least lavish revenues you could extract on huge enterprise contracts, that that's going to last forever is really foolish. It's really mm. foolish to think that companies are going to continue to pay hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on SaaS service contracts forever. Once yeah. the alternatives, either through products or through SaaS services run far leaner, orders of magnitude leaner, yeah. start competing. 
that's going to be fascinating. And we were seeing some folks throw their hands up and they're like, you know what, this experiment is too frustrating for me as a founder. I saw the Roblox guy was like, you can come back or here's your package. The end. And I guess for him, that was the end. I think Apple's now at four days a week. I think now right. uh, and they're basically saying, hey, we, we got to be in the office together doing stuff. We just want to have that kind of culture. And so feels like it's going to bifurcate where some people are like, you know what, experiment over, I need to lay people off anyway. So this seems like a pretty good yes. excuse to if I want to, I call it the gentleman's riff. And I, I, I joked with it with a friend of mine, uh, you know, like, if you ask people to come back to the office, you're automatically going to have 30% of people quit. So if your goal was to get rid of 30% of people, just tell people, hey, we're going back to the office on January 1st and mission accomplished, like people will quit. Um, the problem might be that it's your best 30% uh, quit, is, not your bottom 30%, right? That is right? a challenge, yeah. You don't know which ones will quit. Um, but it does seem like the remote work jobs, because you the, the compression that you're talking about is the key factor. People are doing more with less. They're starting to realize yes. everything was overstaffed. Everybody was spending too much money. We're in a ZERP environment. Everybody was hiring two years ahead of plan. And you don't actually need that many people. So if you looked at Uber, uh, Dara has 1% less people, they grew 30%. And you're like, well, you're growing 30%. And then your headcount has gone down. Uh, whoa, that's weird. Um, and in, I think Airbnb had a very similar thing. They're growing 30% a year over year, whatever it is. And their headcount went down. So there's something about this essentialism. And then also with AI, as you point out, happening all at the same time, remote work, offshoring, and then co-pilots helping developers go faster. And then all of a sudden, management realizes we can do more with less. And then that means eventually, I think you're predicting, correct me if I'm wrong, that once management figures that out, some group of managers say, you know what, we can charge less for this product. That's how capitalism is supposed to yield productivity gains, right? Yeah. This is how society progresses, that we can get more for less, then there are more available resources that can plow into other things, and we can become richer and more prosperous. So to me, it's like, that capitalist soul that really just goes mm. like, this is delicious. This is yeah. what's supposed to happen. This is how we grow the pie. This is how we yeah. all get richer. Um, and I think what's so fascinating is that sometimes it is just like a, a mind shift you need to see in reality mm. to feel it. To me, the pivotal point was what Elon did at Twitter. <laughs> Now yeah, is. I was there you go for from 8,500 yeah. employees to, I believe the latest count is 1,400 or 1,500. Yeah, he got rid of 85%, yeah, basically. Yeah. And that compression, while um, largely not just maintaining the product, but actually accelerating product experimentation and, and so forth. Now, there's a whole other discussion whether the business model is, is sort of creaking a little bit, but that seems separate from, can you run this company in a more efficient way? And I think once Elon prove that sort of at a large scale for a major billion dollar company, uh, the pressure is going to kick in because you're going to have yeah. investors at other companies going like, why are you so fat? Yeah. Get on the freaking Zuck treadmill here. Zuck, Start 20, working 000. out, yeah. get leaner, get, get more leaner. efficient because if you don't, eventually, not next year, maybe, maybe not the year after, but in year three, someone's going to show up and they're going to be ripped. They're going to mm. be ready and they're going to compete you way out of business, which is, again, goes back to all these anecdotes we have. Once there is an order of magnitude jump, right? Blackberry folks going, ha ha ha, those computer folks are not going to waltz in here with their yeah. phone and like teach them. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. If you have an <laughs> order of magnitude Wait advantage in product, yeah. in pricing, in distribution, in any of these things, the whole world is going to tip and it's going to tip first very slowly and then all at once. Yeah, as we've said, how did you go bankrupt? Exactly. Very slowly, all at once. Yeah, things tend that's to- that's what's to exciting, fall. right? This is what- I find I it mean, super exciting because I'm seeing young founders come to me, you know, first time founders, they got three or four people in their company and I'm like, how are you getting all this done? And they're like, well, we have two developers, a designer, and I'm a growth hacker. And it's like the four of you are doing more work than 40 person companies that are burning yes. a million a month and you're burning 40K a month. And oh, and by the way, yes. you're charging a reasonable for your product and people can't believe it's so cheap and there's there's a line out the door. So it, I think for startup culture, the, the 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 price of starting a company, when you and I started, you remember these days, you had to rack and stack a bunch of servers, you had to get an office space, well, it was probably 1.5 million to, to kind of fire it up in the first year, you get 10 employees, servers and an office, probably a million five, two. 
something like that. That was definitely the standard going rate. But the irony yeah. is that Jason and I lived in the future 20 years ago. Yeah. We started with exactly four people. It's funny you mentioned four yeah. people. We started with four people. I remember our salaries. They were from $35,000 to, I think, $45,000. So yeah. our overhead was incredibly low. We subleased yeah. a couple of desks somewhere. I worked from home. And we were able to bootstrap Basecamp on the back on some consulting revenue Boom, a year into it, it's paying all the bills. A couple of years into it, it's just spewing money like a faucet, right? And yeah. I think it's that sort of sense that the future's already here, it's just not widely distributed. I just love mm. that quote, William Gibson. Yeah, And it feels like we live that in terms of startup um, capacity that mm. we could do with four people what we saw folks in the valley needing 44 needing yeah. to raise millions of dollars just in like the initial funding for it let alone a seed round for it and what can you do when your costs are way lower than everyone else first of all you can charge less but you can also make more money which yep. comes into this whole thing about what are you starting a business for are you starting a business for some sort of far future crazy unicorn event or are you starting a business because you want independence Jason mm. and I wanted independence and prided us upon that. Upon it, anything else, it turned out to be that that independence was also just lavishly profitable. And that yeah. you could actually make money in software simply by keeping what's left over after you pay your expenses. That it doesn't have yeah. to be about selling equity. It doesn't have to be about an exit. You can make real money just being a profitable company. And this it, is one of those things where I think the big shift that possibly can happen in startups is that far more companies are going to start like we started in 2004. And they're going to realize that all this is possible with AI, with the realization that remote is possible, with just being more effective and more capable as individual entrepreneurs, and also realizing, do you know what? The other option is just not available. I'm not going to go out and raise $5 million right now. I'm not going to go out and raise $10 million. Like the window has shut, so you have to. Okay, cloud computing has revolutionized startups over the past decade, you know that. But the reality is, hey, a fully cloud-based solution is not right for every startup. Sometimes a hybrid solution is your answer. Like if you're working with sensitive data that can't be trusted to the cloud, or if you need to connect to multiple cloud providers at once, or maybe you just want a much more cost-effective solution. In that case, you need to check out Equinix. Equinix Metal will give you direct access to physical servers, but you still get all the benefits of the cloud. So no need to rack and stack your own servers. No, Equinix provides on-demand infrastructure in over 25 major cities. And here's the best part. They have an amazing startup program for you. The Equinix startup program offers personalized consultations and guidance from the Equinix team. And of course, you'll get up to a hundred thousand dollars in startup credits. So here's what I want you to do. Head to equinixstartups.com to apply. And when you apply, James from Equinix is going to reach out to you directly. That's equinixstartups.com to apply. E-Q-U-I-N-I-X startups.com. I would say funding is down 75%. So it will take you, I'd say for the average founder, it's going to take you five times longer to raise 10% as much money. Yes. You know, compared to the peak ZERP environment. And, you know, if you can raise 250K, you can raise 500K. But these $5 million seed rounds, $3 million seed rounds, $10 million seed rounds, that's over. Uh, and it's much easier, like you're saying, just to have three or four really good people, build it yourself, start making money, don't raise any money, or raise 100,000, whatever the minimum you need yes. to, you know, because not everybody has money saved, you might need that first 100k. Yep. Um, and, and sometimes it's the constraint that really makes the great entrepreneurs. When you and I started in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, there, there just wasn't a lot available to founders. So you had no choice to be a founder. Exactly. You had to be able to produce a product, whether Weblogs Inc., which Brian Alvey and I did, or 37 or Delicious or Flickr. Yes. That whole cohort was built by people who were builders. And it, that's yes. it. I was a writer. Brian Alvey was, you know, uh, a, a coder. Matt Mullenweg was a coder. You know, we made our own CMS, put out a couple of blogs. We sold some ads. I sold them. Yes. And we all of a sudden were yes. off to the races. Uh, and a lot of value got created. And now you look at your company. I mean, you guys make millions of dollars or more in profit every year. And just every year that goes by, that just goes to the founders. Yeah. And I think it's that sense that constraints are actually good. For mm. a long time, at least as I perceived it, Silicon Valley kept telling founders that constraints are bad. No, mm. you need more money. You need more people. You need to go faster. And you know what? I can 
there's a logic to that somehow, somewhere that does produce these outsized paybacks, right? You make a, a thousand angel investments, one of them or two of them are going to be these blowout unicorns that's going to pay for everything. And there's some wisdom in there too. But we were always speaking from the other end of it. Do you know what? Out of a cohort of a thousand, what if we could get like 300 ga- great companies or 400 sure. great companies rather yeah. than just one or two and then the rest of it gets sort of mangled by this process? Um, and then being our own example, do you know what? Running a profitable company that's made millions of dollars in profits for 20 years straight and being conservative with it, just sticking your money like I do. I'm such a boring investor. I just stick it all in ETFs and I go like, you know what? I don't need alpha. Can you just give me market returns over 20 years, millions of dollars accumulating? It's going to add up. And like, you're not going to be left wanting for a bigger yacht or or whatever. Um, And I think that that example, I just really, I want to give that testimony. Do you know what? Mm. This is 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 a way even when there is the unconstrained path is a choice which is was during SERP right like money was just flowing everywhere it was gushing everywhere now money isn't gushing anywhere this choice is still here and it's going to apply to a lot more people because you don't have an alternative and don't boohoo about it it's freaking great it it's, is it's more fun fantastic. in many yeah. ways yeah to live under those constraints the creativity that happens when you have to make do and you have to reuse and you have to double hat and you have yeah. to play five different positions on the same team. Do you know what? It's amazing. It's great. A lot yeah. of founders, or at least a lot of the story goes like, oh, uh, doing a startup is so hard. Uh, as long as I get to the next phase, once I have a two, 500 people, it's going to be so much better. No, it's not. No. I've talked to so many founders who wish back to the days where they were just four people, or 10 people or whatever. It was more fun. It was more invigorating. It's that pressure cooker, those constraints that really make you sh- see what you're made of. And mm. it's fun. So let's yeah. not poo-poo it. Also, that it's, it's like all that entitlement, all of that extra money oh created God, a massive yes. amount of entitlement where yes. people came to work and they felt like, I got to bring my whole self to work. And there's all this extraneous stuff that, you know, we have so much resources, we can sit here and today talk about, I don't know, this war that's happening here, or this social injustice that happened here, or this tragedy that happened here. And then work became like this platform for every issue in the world, as opposed to just the narrow focus, you uh, had chaos inside your company for a brief moment in time before you got control of it. Uh, I think Brian Armstrong led the charge and saying, Hey, listen, I know that this stuff is important to y'all not important to me what's important to me at coinbase is like just making the world financially uh more fair and that's all we're going to work on here so maybe you could give us a recap of after all the chaos uh, and you cleaned everything up and you let people who wanted to have a free-for-all and talk about social issues all day long you let them exit quite generously and uh you got everybody who's at the company focused on work and making yes. software. So h- how's it been for you just in terms of enjoyment and this refocusing? Because it's been a couple of years now after this, right? This happened in it 2020. Has. It's been like two and a half years. And yeah. it's one of those things where I was not eager to conclude anything from it. Even six months past, even a year past, it was difficult. Mm. You don't really know how it plays out until you can look back upon it with some degree of distance. Because there's some emotional aspects tied up into it and so on. Now it's two and a half years. It is without a doubt one of the very best decisions we have ever made in the 20 years that we've mm. been in business, Jason or I. It was very difficult for about a couple of weeks and then was cumbersome for a couple of months. And after we passed the one year mark, it was just bliss. Mm. Bliss in a way I had a hard time even envisioning was possible. This is the problem with how the culture changed at a lot of tech companies that we went through. Basically, I see it as Trump gets elected. People start going, becoming far more involved in politics in a way that just people wasn't lost present their minds. before. It felt existential to people. I get it. Yes. Yeah. And it seeped into work at that same time in the same way that now this was something we're all in the same team resistance, supposedly, mm. all this other stuff, right? And it just builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And then it just went nuts in yeah. 2020. It just went completely crazy to yeah. the point where now I look back upon some of these conversations we had on our work platforms where I just like, <laughs> This is just insane. Well, Madness. why were we doing this stuff, yeah. right? And I think you, you do it because you get cooked and you do it because the culture around you seems to embrace it. All companies are doing this. They're all 
uh, building up a big bureaucracy to enforce this and inject it everywhere. The DEI machinery really got rolling in those yeah. days. And you just think like, this is the new reality. This is going to be the 10-year reign of whatever the hell this is. Um, and we just went cold turkey. And that's yep. why it was so sort of harsh at the time. It was cold turkey at sort of perhaps the peak or right around the peak, right, yeah. of when this was the most crazy. And the public response was just nuts. We had thousands of people. We were trending on Twitter. I had tens of thousands of people calling me all sorts of names and white supremacy this and racist that. And like, yeah. because we don't want to talk politics at work. And then you get these two and a half years, right? And we look back upon it and we go like, wow, amazing. And then I look in the broader culture and I go like, it's not even, a, it's not even anything anymore. A company right. says, like, we don't talk politics at work. It's completely just no one even shrugs anymore. No. This is how quickly the pendulum can swing. Which yep. is one of those things that just gives me so much optimism. Sometimes we go like, oh, this thing is terrible. It's going to be terrible forever. No, do you know what? Just like uh, give it five minutes. It may yep. very well totally change. It's like a storm. It was like this crazy yes. storm blew in and people it were like. It was exactly a storm. And, and then all of a sudden and it clears. Yeah. I like the storm metaphor because you know what? No matter how strong you are, if you're caught in a hurricane, Oof. you're going to spin around. Yeah. There's just There is no amount of personal conviction of power you had in that moment at the peak of that moment where you could have stopped the storm it would it just had to pass right and this is i think why so many companies at the time just laid flat right like a storm yeah. comes through and it flattens all the houses no. all these executives go out they say exactly the same thing there's more work to do all this nonsense right and now the storm has passed in tech at least it hasn't passed at large yeah. and in academia and other places it's still raging almost at full strength but in tech all this stuff just got dismantled all yeah. the bureaucracies that were built up like you don't even hear about it anymore yeah. and first of all i think that's wonderful um yeah. <laughs> we were in a really some dark ages there for a brief moment but also wow i mean yeah. it's only been two and a half years you could have told me it was 15 years since we were in the thick of this and i would have believed you it was it was very intense because it was very personal like if you didn't take a stance on something or if you said yes. hey we're not going to do this there was this machine that was the press and social media where it was like well we have to destroy this person yes. for yes. saying you know this isn't the mission of the company and uh, right. i'm not comfortable with that and you know we actually had it um uh, where people were like, well, how many of these founders have you funded? How many of these founders have you funded? And it just turned out, because I happen to have a lot of uh, diversity on my team in terms of women, um, that we had funded a lot of women founders. I think, looking back on it, it was because women felt more comfortable applying, because we had more women. And um, we had done some events for underrepresented founders. But I had to go back to my team and say, just so we're clear here, we can increase the number of applicants. We can be supportive of everybody and encourage everybody to start companies. And that's good work. But when we make the investments, we're an investment firm. It has to be blind. We're not investing yes. based on gender, based on age, based on any other criteria. We, we do not, we cannot use that criteria. And I, you know, I had this conviction, but it was kind of like, it was a little shaky for me to say it. Because I was like, it's illegal for us to do this. And now here we are, you know, the the Harvard uh, case and everything, Supreme Court. Hey, you know, you, you really can't pick people and exclude Asian people from Harvard because they're Asian and you have too many Asians and they score. They just did too well. We can't do that. If, if it turns out some group of people and their startups perform better, I can't say, well, we can't invest in you because of this. And a lawsuit happened for this company, uh, this venture firm, Fearless Founders. Their, their mission was to invest in more uh, black founders, uh, female black founders. And I said, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, it's your money, you can do what you want. But a group of Asian women and white women are now, and I think Hispanic are now suing them. So this is where you realize identity politics is a road to nowhere, because somebody's going to get left out, somebody's going to feel bad. And it's going to just result in chaos. And, you know, it's, it's easy for me to say, like a meritocracy is best. But it does need to be a meritocracy. Let's be honest. I don't think anybody wants a handout. So, you know, and, and we can have this conversation now. You couldn't have this conversation three years ago or else people would clip it and say, oh, my God, look at these monsters saying that it should be a fair process. And the person who has the best results should get the opportunity, you know, 100%. And I think yeah. that's it wasn't just a road to nowhere. It was a road to hell. 
the yeah. identity politics as they grip tech and a lot of other uh, domains just led to absolute hell. Yeah. And you, just, you don't even get the outcomes you want for the people you're trying to help. This theory no. of disparate impact that if you can do a statistical analysis um, that shows that certain group didn't get this or didn't get that, that that de facto proves discrimination is just the most insane theory to ever grip an entire paradigm and go like, this is how we should structure everything, that mm. everything has to be subdivided in a bunch of things. What was so interesting for me was like, I was very sympathetic to a lot of the core ideas. Hey, yeah, let's help people who like have had a tough break or this, that, and the other thing. I came from Denmark, a society that has a broad safety net and does a bunch of things to level the playing field, however you want, yeah. but it's leveling the playing field in terms of opportunities. Mm. We're not going to ban you from getting the chances, but when you step up to the bat, like, I don't care who you are, what determines whether you make the team is whether you hit the ball. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. We cannot go like, oh, well, you can't hit a ball. You're still going to be on the team because like your team yeah. red jersey or something. No, 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 no. And that falsehood, I think, was really the root of all evil as it came to this, right? The disparate impact theory as it came from law first and so forth. And this evolution that I went through was, was really instructive. And it was one of those things where I, there's, I don't know how many colored pills there are at this point, but I was pilled in mm. whatever color it was to some <laughs> degree, starting reading um, other authors like Thomas Sowell and listening to uh, Glenn Lowry and, and other thinkers on this who came at the question from a conservative perspective, where prior to all this nonsense going, I would have been like, do you know what? I'm a left-leaning, I'd probably vote Democrat, i do all these other things, and i just like go wherever this flow is, is going. And then something like that happens together with COVID, which itself was a, a mind right? And yeah. the handling of that. We just go like, you know what? Now let's take two steps back, revisit things from first principles, go, do you know what? This disparate impact theory of how to organize society is just an absolute, not just dead end, but a road to hell. We can't do it. We got to step back. We got to get somewhere else. Mm. And do you know what the irony is? At our company, so we had yeah. about a third of the company quit, right? Our company ended up more diverse after the fact. Huh. Interesting. More gender diverse, more uh, ethnic diverse, more diverse in terms of how many people were in the US versus outside the US. These things are not in direct opposition. Mm. And this is the fallacy of so much of this uh, nonsense, which mm. is often spewed from people, not necessarily in those groups, although it is sometimes, but also a bunch of other people who, for whatever reason, have guilt that they need to process in a public sphere. And they do it in a, in a way where, do you know what, this, this is just not true. This is yeah. just not true. And we said, no, we're not doing that. At a time where that was difficult to say, mm. now it's not difficult at all, right? Like now no. it's even the standard. We barely even talk about it. That's well, how quickly the discussion changed. It went from, if you say anything about this, we're going to haunt you on Twitter. This is yeah. also why, by the way, I think this <laughs> Elon acquisition taking Twitter was that Elon Musk yeah. did was yeah. one of the pivotal changing points, right? You can look yeah. at all, like what made the storm pass? One out of maybe four major factors was that the ownership of Twitter now X changed hands. Mm. And Elon yeah. just went in, we're not gonna do things the old way. It's not gonna be tilted and slanted with this ideological bent. So that was a huge change. As you said, this um, Harvard decision from the Supreme Court, huge change. And I also just think at some point, people are gonna be tired of being in the storm. You know what? Yeah. I think there's something exciting about a storm, right? Storm chasers and all these other, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. these forces <laughs> are just storm so chasers in this for sure. awesome to watch, right? And you yeah. go like, you know what? Um, it reminds me of uh, public hangings. So yes. I think this was abolished in France in like what, late 1700s or something. It was not abolished because the people didn't want the public hangings. Public hangings were amazingly popular. One yeah. of the favorite pastimes of people in France, they were like, this is great. We get to see someone flogged or tortured or hanged. Sign me up for that, right? This is the modern equivalent of that when the storm was going crazy. Every day you had Every public, day you, a different person got canceled or destroyed. Public destruction, right? And you're like, yeah. I think at some point, even um, people who might enjoy that for a moment go like, okay, enough. That's enough. Yeah, that's, it's way too much. Now, in terms of optimism, we've got people very concerned uh, about, uh, we saw this pretty acutely with OpenAI uh, and some of the, um, I guess, um, people who want to slow down AI progress because they're concerned. And people who want to accelerate progress so much so that we now have this e excel 
thing people are putting in their uh, bios. And then you got people who want to be everybody wants to be part of some group. I I'm not sure who's running these groups exactly. Um, but what was your take watching this whole crazy Meshuggah over at OpenAI? And if it was in fact, because people some people want to slow down progress, and some people want to speed it up, where do you land on that? Speed it up, slow it down? Are you worried? So the first thing I'd say is um, one of the uh, benefits of being past the age of 40 and having yeah. gone through some of this stuff is I have perhaps less stringently sort of one take positions on this. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I do lean accelerate. I do lean optimism. I do lean this is the better default, that we have to have more to go on and it has to be more concrete than, do you know what? I have this fantasy that robots is going to kill us all. You yeah. know what? That's not operational. That It needs more than that. And I am more in Mark Andreessen's camp here than I am in, um, in some of the Doomers camp. Yeah. Um, and this idea that we can have a timeout is just Gnostic bullshit. It is yeah. like we have this sort of ceremony here that we're going to sacrifice some goats to the gods and then they're going to be kind and mm. then our crops will grow well next year, right? I think there's this quest right now, search for meaning, broadly speaking. I think that's what powered a lot of the nonsense that was happening with all the woke stuff yeah. that kind of just has drifted into this because we're dealing with the same root problem, right? Um, we've killed God, as Nietzsche said, and like, what are we going to put in its place? We've killed organized religion. We need to believe in something. We're yeah. not going to apparently believe in country anymore. So what's up? Well, you can pick team doomerism or team E accelerate. And like that can give you some sense of identity. For me, I just go like, you know what? This is going to happen anyway. Accelerate. Step on this pedal. Sure. Until yeah. we have something where like, do you know what? It is more than a thought experiment. Um, that there's more to it, we got to go, right? Yeah. We could have stopped everything. Imagine someone pitching you the internet in oh, like yeah. 92. Anybody can say whatever they want. Any information can be shared with anybody. You, yes. There was this actual discussion at the beginning, which was, what if somebody puts a bomb recipe on the internet? Yes. It's like, yes. well, then the police come and they arrest them and if it's against the law. there's been a bomb recipe on the internet for 30 years. Yes. You've and been able books to find the, the anarchist library. handbook yeah. if you search yeah. hard enough, right? Do you know what? That was not the end of civilization if not the no. end of society yeah. so i think this idea that if you can look at that and you can also look at another debate which is the encryption debate which corner was really hot in the 90s that was how we got pgp they yeah. were just about to ban encryption and then pgp goes out there um whatever simmerman or something else forget his name puts the software out there and would any of us think that it would be responsible to walk around with a pocket computer that if we dropped it Someone could get all our health information. Someone Everything. could get all our communication history. Someone could get all of this stuff. It's almost impossible to think that encryption could have been illegal. Yeah, right. It's or wild. could have been banned yeah. or could have been backdoored or could have been something else such that we couldn't protect our own information. I think, again, this is all about odds. It's about the future. We don't know. But I would guess that AI is going to be more like encryption and more like the internet than it's going to be like the atom bomb. Yeah. Right? That it's going to be more like we cannot even conceive that you remember in the 2023s when these doomers were about to blow up open AI just at the yeah. cusp of major productivity gains and flourishing and, and whatever um, because of some fantasy about the end of the world. Jesus Christ, that would have been a bad idea. I hope well, that's how we look back upon it. I think it will be because, you know, I'm looking at the results from it. I think everybody just watches these language models give them a response and they're like oh my god this is amazing and then i'm like did you check those facts because i just checked three of the facts and they're completely wrong <laughs> and <laughs> i think what just happened was it just read like 20 how-to articles and then yeah. it just re rewrote them and so it's really good at rewriting something but because it's going line by line you actually in the ux think it's thinking and because it took a second you know and, and i thought it was very interesting with bard where it's just like boom Here's the rewritten version, but with ChatGPT, it writes it, and so you're like, "Oh, I guess it's thinking and it's spinning the wheel." And and then I look at it, and I'm like, "These facts are wrong." And this is taken from this how-to article on this website or this Quora answer. This actually isn't thinking; it's guessing the next predictive word. So I think we're like almost jumping the gun. But that is gun. so human. That is yeah. so human. That's what I actually love about it: the fact <laughs> that this makes mistakes. 
yeah. proves that we're on the path of something that perhaps we are running large language models in oh, our for heads sure. right now, right? This is why we spew facts that aren't facts. Yes. This is why we make draw connections that aren't true, why we come up, why we hallucinate, why yes. we invent facts, right? This to me is actually the most endearing part of the whole AI thing, that it is so human in yes. all its failings um, mm. that I actually could believe, you know what, maybe something profound has been discovered here that like, this is actually maybe how consciousness works. Now, now we get really gnostic about like, what is it actually going on in there? We don't know. But I look at that and I go like, you know what, this is this is very human, which perhaps is the argument for the doomer side, right? Like if it is so human, isn't it going to defend or descend all into savagery at some point and <laughs> whatever? The Lord of the Flies. Okay, yeah. fine. But I, again, we got to see where this goes. To me, it's also just, just interesting. AI is the most interesting thing that has happened to computing since the internet. To I me, agree, it's far yeah. more interesting than mobile. It is, it's the internet, right? It's the internet over again. That doesn't come around that often, like in my lifetime, that has literally only happened once before. Yeah. The other thing I look at is the internet, at least once it got going and you had Amazon.com and a few other things, normal people instantly got it. Mm. Right? You'd put them down in front of something, they'd have a question, they'd search the internet, they'd look something up on Yahoo, they'd go like, wow, this yeah. thing, this network can do things and tell me things I could not do or could not know before. I'm in. Yes. I've shown chat GTP to, to my wife, to my kids. I've let them play with it. They get it instantly. Yes. They, not just to get it, right? There's an intellectual no, they're understanding. Like, I'm going to use it more. They what, use it. Don't take it away from me. I need it. Exactly. Yes. And it's that product to me market is fit the instantly. wisdom yeah. Of, yeah. of the masses, right? We can have doomers who are very articulate in mm. their theories about how the world is going to end and then you have a whole millions of people at this point this is why chat gdp is the fastest growing product ever people are voting with their feet this is what capitalism open free markets is supposed to give us it's yeah. supposed to direct progress we should yes. have more of this progress because it's very appealing it is genuinely making lives better more interesting more novel more everything right yeah do you know what? That's a good general predictor, and we should follow that. Generally speaking, when we follow what people want, we end up in a better place. It was interesting today. I was like, you know what? I, I released this blog post in my Substack and on LinkedIn, and I was like, oh, you know what? I didn't put a header image on it. So I opened up uh, Dolly, yes. and I was like, make me an image uh, for a productivity blog post. And they gave me this like thing, like a desk with productivity. And I was like, add a cup of coffee and a bulldog. It adds a cup of coffee and a bulldog, and I put it on the site. <laughs> It looked like I spent, I kid you not, $1,000 hiring an illustrator to make this beautiful image. And I was like, wow, coming from a magazine background in the 90s where we used to hire illustrators, that was probably the best illustration we ever would have paid for. And illustrations yes. took two weeks. And I yes. just described something and it <laughs> just happened. Oh my God, this is clearly going to be a situation where I'm going to say, you know what? I really loved uh, The Sopranos and I loved these two episodes. Can you make me a couple more like that? And it's just yes. literally gonna be like, you know what? Yes. Here's a four episode Sopranos just for you, J. Cal. And it's it's in your it's waiting for you. And I'm gonna be thrilled with that. Or I love this Mark Knopfler song and Dire Straits song, and Dire Straits is never gonna come back together. But here's here's their, you know, here's another five tracks. Here's five Dire Straits songs that they never wrote. It's gonna be awesome. And it's so like, you can it's see, gonna you be feel better. like it's so close, right? Yes. And not even close. It's already here. I mean, yeah. the sense, the degree to which I was shocked by the Dali stuff, the image generation, yeah. um, mid journey and all those things that to me was even more mind blowing than the LMs. Yes. I would not There's no way you could have asked me in like, whatever, five years ago, that the first thing that AI is going to replace is essentially the creative field. Or not yes. replace, augment, uh, whatever you want to call it, right? A viable A option. hyper productize. Yeah. Um, and this is why it's so interesting that we cannot predict where all this is going to go, which is why we must follow the white rabbit. We must follow where the white rabbit goes because that's just where life is more interesting, more appealing. Yeah. And this is what um, my uh, my family just did uh, with Dali. They generated my uh, my son had this thing of gang for kids of 10 year olds who just like to be in a group together right they're called mm. the chicken wings and they're like i'd like to have a chicken that has a gun with an explosion in the back and it turned out amazing and we got it printed on some t-shirts and we just went like this is the future like it this is so far future that i could not even have predicted this was remotely possible like 10 years ago 
Look at this. Years ago. Look at me. I, I went awesome. and Dolly, make me an inspiring <laughs> header for a blog post about productivity with the dimensions of this. And it made me these two images. I was like, wow, that looks like pretty amazing. Like fast company would have spent five thousand dollars. It's like make it even more inspiring and include hot coffee <laughs> and a bulldog. And I'm like, boom. This is the great. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? This is That's unbelievable. So That's so good. It's so good. <laughs> it totally understood. This is what's so good about AI. You don't have to squint and imagine things at a very high conceptual level. You can literally look at it right now, today, and go yeah. like, holy sh**, the world is different now. Yeah. Now, what's so fascinating about it, you can recognize that change that has already happened, and you can go like, you know what? I don't have the faintest clue what the world is going to look like in five years, and neither does anyone else. Not the mm. doomers, not the accelerators. We just don't know. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. This is the next one I did. I was on a board call and uh, they had questions about like, you know, like who, who should run an Amazon web store, right? And I, I'm literally on a board call and I just write, what are the titles and responsibilities of an Amazon marketplace manager? Because I'm like, I know that's the title, but I don't know what they actually do. And it's oh, like, yeah. oh, here's exactly what they do. Here's the responsibilities. And yes. I'm like, ah, yeah, that's it. Thank you for doing that so quickly while I'm on a call. And you think about like the base camp original logo. And I was talking to somebody about logos. I remember in the 90s, when people started companies in the 90s, what did a logo cost? Like if you hired a, an ad agency or a, an agency, when you had your agency, what would you charge out for a logo in 1999? Oh, it was thousands. Even the 90s, it was thousands. Even the 90s, it was 5,000 bucks, right? And you yes. would have a meeting and then you do like a totally. back and forth, a presentation. Right. It would be what, a month engagement, four Speed. weeks, six weeks, Speed. something totally. like that? Totally. It, maybe three or four meetings to be 10 people in the room and you take it out all this. Now you're just like, make me a logo for this new company, once.com. And here's what yes. we do. And you just next, yes. next, next, and a couple little things. And all of a sudden you have a logo that probably would have been $5,000 in expense. Yes. And it's, it's better. Yes. And you did it. So this is something that sh has never existed in humanity. This is the thing I find really inspiring. People who didn't take the time to learn how to draw as but one example, do illustration. And now they can make really compelling illustration. So you've compressed that, right? You've democratized illustration. You're going to democratize writing copy. You're democratizing and just make, making everybody at 80%, maybe in the top third of designers. And then, yeah, there'll always be elite designers, elite logo people. But if everybody becomes really good, let's put aside elite. Let's pretend elite's going to exist forever. But if everybody becomes really good at making logos and copy, it's a pretty compelling world. Every product this is gets a the little edge bit of better. Abundance, right? Yes. Like you look at something and you get so much abundance, so much productivity, orders of magnitude. Being, this is how we get growth, right? Yes. You look at a lot of growth uh, curves, and they actually look kind of depressing. You think like, haven't we been doing so much over? Let's just say the last fifteen years or so, right? And you're like, you know what? The growth curves are a little meh. Right. They're not actually not as much has happened as we would like to think. Oh, everything's moving so fast. Everything's getting so much better. Everything's getting cheaper. And you know what? A lot of really important things haven't gotten better, faster, cheaper. Some of the big things um, in education, for example, this is the one that really blows my mind. Mm. Like uh, yesterday, I was talking to my son about Einstein's relativity theory, about um, quantum computing. And you know what? I don't know all the specifics about all of these things in the history tracing on E equals MC squared. You know what? We ask a couple of questions of ChatGDP, something that perhaps in the olden days you would have Googled for it, which is, by the way, why I think this is absolutely an existential threat to Google. I cannot imagine that most people are going to go to Google first going yeah. forward for most of their questions. They may still want to find a business or do something else. Okay, great. Am I going to ask Google tomorrow like, hey, um, tell me what that Amazon marketplace manager did. That would be a Google search for you Absolutely. two years ago. Absolutely. It's yeah. never going back to being a Google search, right? No. You're just going to ask an AI for questions like that. And in education, that is so damn powerful that not yeah. only can you constantly go, tell me more. You can mm -hmm. go, tell me more, but you know what? The way you explained it was a little complicated. Can you, can you make it simpler for me? And it will. Mm -hmm. So I think there's these massive unlocks of abundance coming. Imagine you had the greatest tutor the world had ever seen, yep. well-versed in every language ever spoken, know every book, know every classic, know every field, and you could ask them anything for as long as you wanted, yep. and they had infinite patience to teach you. I mean, this is Nirvana 
when it comes to education, just as yeah. one aspect of it. It's going to, our, our kids are going to have a much different experience. I, I literally was driving with my 13 year old and uh, they were like, Hey, well, what's this thing with Hamas? And like, explain it to me. And I literally have set up my um, action button. There's a thing called the action button on the new iPhone 15. And I set my action button up to be the, you know, the with chat GPT, you can have a conversation with it now and it talks back yes. to you. And so I set it up to that. So I'm driving, I press and hold the button. And I'm like, explain to me the uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict and what the solutions are. And we just sat there and drove for 10 minutes. And it explained it to us. And you know, I'm, I've read about it. I it was very accurate. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. You could just be driving, like you said, and you have this tutor there who's going to explain everything to you. And uh, I know you don't like, you know, you're like you're a big fan of copy. But while we were sitting here, I just decided I'd make the once logo. <laughs> here's here's awesome. your one ship number one logo. there. Ship it, ship it. Yeah. And then I was like, <laughs> you know what, make it more organic, like a forest, because oh, I know you like Jesus. a little bit more. <laughs> and I'm That's just like, good. Oh, my God, That's it's good. so good. <laughs> what is happening? Like, yes. And this is year, by the way, this is the end of year one of chat yes. GPT 3.5. Yes. Like literally this week is when it came out. And, and you just think about, well, what's year two going to be like? I will um, tell you, nothing had made me more susceptible to the idea that we live in a simulation than this. Because I could not comprehend the acceleration happening. Like I go like, you know what? I built software for a living. I know how long it takes to ship a feature. How is it possible that yeah. AI is advancing every few weeks in these major leaps? It doesn't even seem plausible, right? No. Like everything I know about software does not compute with this, which is again, why I find it so exhilarating that it had that same quality of like, I don't fully understand this. I understand some of it and I've looked at some of this and this is Transformers this and this is pairings and it's the next word. Yes, 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 I still don't get it. How do mm. we get from that math to this outcome, right? Like that it feels like we really have created gods out of sand and silicon. Yeah. And that is just, imagine a time to be alive, right? Yeah. I think of, do you know what? I'm halfway done. I am mm. 44. Yep, you're halfway. You know what? Me too. I'm, I'm halfway. Yeah. How fortunate I should be to have to seen live not at just this the moment internet. in time. Our generation, Gen Xers, were yes. there for the internet and yes. for AI. We incredible, have the before right? and after. It's incredible. Yes. And and in our in my lifetime, I have known people who were born prior to World War One. Like yeah. The, the span of human acceleration, this is why whenever I get pessimistic, and yeah. I think I'm, I'm a recovering pessimist, I'll say. <laughs> whenever I used to be like, yeah, do you know what? The world is shit, or this is shit, that's shit. It's like, do you know, no, no, no. Zoom out. Look at the big picture on this little blue dot in like people's I know and could touch his lifetime. We've gone from not having an airplane to have an AI. Yeah. That's just incredible. Crazy. We should be very optimistic people, of course, trying to make things better and so on. But I think you actually do make being, things better faster if you are an optimist. This is why I really just can't connect to the doomerism because it smells so much of like the drag that often gets injected into innovation with bureaucracy, right? Like, hey, do you know what? What does this actually mean, doomerism? It means that some people supposedly much smarter than all the rest of us should get to decide exactly where the limits are, where where the contours are, what should we not go beyond? Do you yeah. know what? If we had given the high priests of the Dark Ages the license to forever dictate where the boundaries of astronomy went, yep. uh, do you know what? We wouldn't be firing rockets to Mars. Nope. <laughs> no, no satellites, no Starlink. And no. if you, it, it almost feels like there's a generation as well who they've been raised so coddled. They, they haven't had adversity. And so they don't yes. actually understand like, what abundance is because all that's all they've kind of had it's only been abundance there's never been like a headwind they didn't have vietnam they, they didn't have any of these you yes. know um the suffering or pain and we might be the last generation that actually in the united states at least in the west that kind of remembers the generation telling us like who oh, the nazis oh vietnam they used like, to be actually hard yeah actually this, this trauma was really used brutal. to mean you're yeah. arm got blown up by a mortar literal grenade. trauma like trauma right. wasn't yes my, i was made to feel bad trauma yes my, these words hurt my feelings but i literally had physical trauma where my arm was blown off by a mortar 
Uh, yes. Or my brother didn't come home, God forbid, from this war. Yes. And, and this is where... I mean, the like, irony, of course, is, I mean, old men has since forever sat around in circles and talked about how the young ones yeah. are, like, not gritty enough, uh, not uh, smart enough. So I think uh, that's part of it. But uh, that also doesn't mean that some of it isn't real, right? Like, yes. what I just think is, hopefully we're trading it in for something. If we're trading in the grit and resilience of past generations, and I do think we are to some extent, I hope we're getting something back in return. Mm. And it's not as obvious right now what that is. What are we yeah. getting back from all this grit and independence and so on we're giving up? So I just lived uh, three years in Denmark. And it's really interesting because Denmark, when it comes to raising kids, for example, exists in what almost can be described as a time bubble of what mm. the United States used to be in 1980 where you could let a nine-year-old out by themselves, walk wow. a mile, take a metro, do something that would absolutely get you arrested in yeah. any major city in America today. And you go like, huh, that's so fascinating. Like, I remember being a kid in the 80s. My wife was American. Remember being a kid in America in the 80s where these things were possible. It's no longer possible. And I don't think we fully realized, well, some people have. Jonathan Haidt, for example, not only is he great scholar on moral philosophy, but he also looks into this um, idea of independence with kids, that why what, what the coddling of the American mind covers this idea that kids have lost so much independence, and this is partly why Gen Z is a little crazy on some things and yeah. a little fragile and see trauma in, behind every door and so forth. It's because, you know what, if you were never gave them the opportunity to, to face some degree of adver adversity, some degree of uncertainty, some degree of like, you know, Danger. you gotta figure this shit out on your own, yeah. um, you're not going to develop those skills, right? And this is also one of those things I think I've changed my mind on more, like mm. more gone to, do you know what? I need to make sure that my kid has some <laughs> days. Mm. Yes. It cannot some adversity. be sunshine yes. and rainbows. Yeah, it's it got to be something, yeah. Yes. I, uh, I have a, a strategy for that. Uh, taking the kids skiing on very cold days or taking them on hikes in the rain. It turns out yes. weather we talked about the storms earlier but like literal storms yes. when it's really brutal the germans have some expression i think it's the germans that there's it's there's no bad weather there's just bad clothes the and Danes so have that one exactly they have one that same too. one yes <laughs> so i heard that at some point and uh one morning i had promised my daughter was 13 you know when she was six i was going to take her on a hike she loved these hikes to the beach and it is a storm like bay area storm like you wouldn't believe and she's like, oh, I guess we can't go on the hike. I'm like, no, heck yes. Here's your boots. Here's your jacket. We're going. We go on this hike. She talks about it to this day. I have the That's pictures awesome. from that hike. We pull them up sometimes. We got to the ocean. It was like chaos. Yes. There was rivers flowing everywhere. There's just lightning and everything. And when we got to the trail, I get to the trail end. And there's like three or four people coming up the trail. Like, don't go down there. And my daughter and I are like, yeah, we're going down there. And they're like, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. Good. And we did it. It was great. And, you know. The same thing happens with, with skiing. And I remember with my dad going out on these like hard ski trips and the winds hitting in the face. This is my tip, like the weather and like harshness and being out there in the mountains or whatever. That's a good way to get some grit going. I, I mean, for me in Brooklyn, it was the New York City subway system, but <laughs> slightly totally. different. I I, I just read a book called The Comfort Crisis that covers this. This idea uh, that we've lost connection to physical hardship and that that is not good for us at all. What's and it, it called? Really comfort? The Comfort Crisis. Uh. It's written by a men's uh, journal journalist who goes out on this month-long expedition in Alaska to hunt. Oh, wow. And basically have to just live in Alaska for a month out in the blizzards and wilderness and, and hardship and difficulty and so forth. And mm. It was actually reading that book that um, made me start taking cold showers. It was, it's funny because cold showers is one of those things that to me seemed like such a Silicon Valley fad, which yes. I, I will attest to the fact that, you know what, if something just comes out of that, I have a natural skepticism that will make it yes. less likely for me to just adopt it. And I read that's the comfort crisis and go like, you know what, I should also just occasionally feel things that aren't as nice as they could be, which mm. the irony of this is this piece of wisdom is literally thousands of years old. You can look back to the Stoics and you can mm. read Seneca talking about, you know what, occasionally you should walk without shoes just to feel the pinch on your the bottom of your feet. Yeah. Sometimes you should just be out in the rain. Sometimes you should embrace this uh, hardship in part so that you can appreciate, as you say, the abundance that you have in your daily life. You can appreciate, oh, do you know what, just having heat is actually a luxury of immense 
benefit, having light that you can just turn off, all these trappings of modern life we yeah. take for granted, and then we become insolent, entitled <laughs> parts so exactly. much of the time. I can't wait and to read you know this what? book. Yeah. Yes, Looks getting great. getting that exposure to the wilderness, getting willful exposure to the fact that the obstacle is the way, I think yeah. is another um, phrase from the I, Stoics. Yeah, no, I, I Make I it got hard that. because it's I hard got the cold good. plunge. I got the cold plunge and I do it. And when I do it, I'm like, I really don't want to do this. But if I do it and I get through it, I feel so alive. And it yes. I, I did all the research on it and I was listening to Huberman or whatever. And it, they kind of explained it. They're like, if the temperature and the length you want to do it is what is challenging. So it, there are people who've gotten so good at this cold plunge stuff that they could sit in there for five minutes. I was with a friend who did it for four minutes in like 46 degrees or something. I did it. I got, I got hypothermia immediately. I started like <laughs> panting and like, oh, it's just like my body started quivering and shaking. But you have to do it to feel uncomfortable, get through yes. it. And like you're saying, like getting through it is the thing the, the obstacle is the path. And, um, and yeah, being uncomfortable is good. Being sure. pampered all the time will make you soft, will Big make time. you weak. And it's one of those things. It's so funny because as we talked about, um, over the last five years, I think I've had personal turning points on more big topics than in my, the rest of my entire life. And this is one of those things where I just, uh, it felt so insufferable listening to some of this stuff. Oh, called plunges this or hardship this or walk around bare feet or whatever. It's one of those things you, you can't really convey it. You got to tell people, but you know what? My best argument is just give it a try. Give just a try, for example, yeah, sure. I had not taken a cold shower in probably 15 years mm. prior to that. Like I had just lived in a world where the water always came out hot or I could yeah. wait for it to become hot. And I never had to subject myself to anything even cold, which is so ludicrously um, pampered yes in the sense of like the human experience over the period of time right yeah. that wow imagine humans can live today and they're never exposed to anything less than that pampering and then you do it and you go like oh shit. no argument mm. no verbalization no articulation of the benefits Huberman listing oh this is good for you because longevity blah blah blah, blah. no 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 you got to feel the shock in your own body that's going to give me the argument for this above all else it's easy to be cynical, you know, it's easy. I, I tell the people about this about Burning Man, like I was like, New Yorker cynical about Burning Man. And then I went, and I was like, you know what, it's kind of cool to watch people go build art, and music, and, you know, this community uh, over a week in the desert. And it's super inspiring. And I thought, wow, this is like, amazing. I, I went to the art projects. And I was like, you know, I, I never really appreciated going to art galleries. But driving around the plow on a playa on a bicycle, and hearing people play music and looking at the art they created, I found like really inspiring. And yeah, it's easy to be like, yeah, Burning Man is a bunch of dirty hippies and weird and whatever. And it's like, no, nope, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Like, there's that, a lot of really soulful say art. That because my current mental image is that Burning Man is exactly a bunch of privileged hui. And this is why I love coming on the podcast because <laughs> of some yeah. of that challenge of, do you know what? Um, I can also just, I can, yes. No, we'll go to Burning great. Man together. I mean, yes. I'm, literally, I'm telling you, <laughs> like, and there is a douche, like, these dudes, like, like, a bunch of Russians came and, like, set up, like, a pop-up camp when a bunch of Russian billionaires, like, set it up, whatever, and they were not part of the community, and they just kind of, whatever, did an exclusionary kind of thing. But they actually have this, like, rule set, uh, and radical self-reliance and inclusion are, like, two of the kind of rules there. It turns out, like, being self-reliant, you don't get to experience that much. And then, also... If you have like a camp and you're hosting dinner, you're having dinner, you can't exclude people. Like if somebody walks by, you're, you're the, the philosophy of it is like, yeah, just invite them in and, and give them some food. And you're like, oh, wow, the world can That's be great. nice and kind and interesting. And so anyway, it's absolutely and easy to be cynical about it. And then when you go, you're like, wow, this person spent months building this incredible, beautiful art installation and it looks dope. That's great. And I think that that connects exactly to that general sense of optimism as a recovering pessimist that what i'm trying to work on is just you know what the world is more interesting when people are doing different <laughs> that i can't currently in my position imagine being good or beautiful or whatever and then they do it anyway and i should try some of those things more mm. um i should try to lean in harder i should try leaning harder intellectually into ideas that i find challenging or difficult or even stupid even yeah. better if they're stupid, right? Even better if you look at something straight in the eye and go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
yeah. and then you just sit back and you keep staring at it. Check and this thing out. Oftentimes, sticking with the that degree of okay, that's pretty cool. So literally, that I was cynicism. I'm it just, driving it just down the playa, up. and I see this from miles away, and it was called the Tree of Tenere. Anyway, it's Burning Man 2017, and I see this tree that the leaves are made of like LEDs. And you could see it from across the playa. And I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. I, I, how did they do it? How did these lunatics make each leaf into an LED? I don't know. And I don't know what they spent on this. That's this looks great. like this cost a hundred thousand dollars. It could have cost a million dollars. They made a tree of LEDs. Look at all these weirdos like hanging out at the street. It was literally far off in the playa at the end of the playa, this crazy tree. Anyway, I, I and this is Learned. where I can just, I can almost preempt this with the comment section. Here's a bunch of privileged um, yeah. venture back Capitalist, Silicon yeah. Valley Weirdos, types internet. who just squander money when we could be saving starving children in Africa or whatever sure. uh, effective altruism argument you can make for all the resources Absolutely. of the world should go to these few specific problems and nothing else. And you know what? F*** that. That yes. is such a dead end of thinking of being right yes. that everything has to be rendered in this context of like oh you could have done this do you know what we are humans we can do more than one thing life is better when there's also music and art and weird f dirty hippies in the desert <laughs> um on top of also trying to solve other problems in the world right this dichotomy thinking of um unless you are a paternal pessimist about all the things because there are um st structural inequities or this that and the other thing um you're just like you're just privileged it's just that's perhaps one of the things i've gotten most over and most tired yeah. of watching just in the last uh, few years i mean you could literally complain about the Eif every night the eiffel tower has a light show that is delights everybody who comes there exactly. and squanders amounts of energy shouldn't all we be that saving energy you could the world Get another somehow. there's somebody starving where they could it's like yes. no there's enough energy that we can light it up and people could feel some joy in their life and what a great episode david thanks for coming yes. on uh we'll book it for My a year pleasure. from now and we'll we'll rant Please about do. everything and uh we'll catch up soon and we'll see you all next time on this week in startups bye-bye